Um, so welcome to, I think, the first rise, no, maybe the second rise thing that I have done. It's been a while. It's been a very long while. So if there are technical difficulties, um, flag somebody else down. I probably can't help you. <laughs> so my name is Paige, and I am the teen brarian here at Lethbridge Public Library which means that I run all of the collections and programs for those in age uh, grades 7 through 12 here in the Lethbridge area. I also uh, can act as a resource for all of the other Chinook Arch Regional Library System libraries should they want to ask me questions. I'm more than happy to answer those. Um, I've put up a couple ways to contact me on there, and I'll repeat this at the end. So my email is page.mcgeorge at lethlib.ca. I'm also on Twitter and most other social media as Teen Brarian, um, except Pinterest because some woman in Georgia took it before I could get it. So not better at all about that. Um, I've been the Teen Brarian here at LPL since we opened the Crossings Branch, which was in August of 2010, so that's coming up seven years. Before that, I was what I called the hybrid librarian here at LPL, so I was half children's department, half adult department. Uh, so I've worked a little bit of everywhere here at Lethbridge. Um, I did my master's at Dalhousie and did a fair number of classes on children's and YA materials and programming. Um, so I have that in the back of my brain, and I guess my very first gig at the library, I was page the page for two years in the children's department here in Lethbridge when I was younger. Um, so if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, just unmute your mic and toss them out there, maybe, you know, like flail to get my attention. I think that also kind of activates the camera so you pop up as the main screen. So these are some of the things that I'm going to kind of go through today. Um, what do you do with teens in the library, um, including how do you get teens in the library? How do you make sure the library is a welcoming space and reflects the needs of the teens in your community? And what are some of the things we've done at LPL, both successes and failures? I think sometimes they're equally fun to talk about the good things and the bad things that have happened. Um, does anybody have anything else they want me to go over that I should add to this? Anything you're dying to know about? All right. Well, we'll move on. So what do you do with teens in the library? How many of you regularly have teens coming into your library? Okay, I see one, maybe two hands, couple hands, couple hands. Uh, so the library where my office is, um, is our branch library here in Lethbridge. It's the Crossings branch over on the west side. That branch library is located between two high schools. So we're one long, long building with a public high school on one side, a Catholic high school on the other, and then the library in the center. So on average, I think on our lunch hours, we're seeing between two and 400 teenagers at lunch because there's pretty much, there is a Tim Hortons now, there wasn't until about eight months ago. Uh, it, before that it was us in the dirt field. Those were their picks, that's all they had. So we see a lot of teenagers over on the west side, but that's not kind of a usual situation, that's more of an anomaly. I think with most libraries it can be a fight to get teens into the library or at least teens into the library and engaging with library staff collections and resources. So one of the big things I think is to really find out what the teens in your community, in your area, are interested in. What, are, what do they want to find out more about? What can you incorporate into programming that's gonna catch their attention and bring them in? So I threw together a bit of a list here um, and we've tried programs about most of these things here at LPL at one time or another. Um, last couple of years, we've had a lot of focus on kind of the fandom access that was something they were really into. Uh, so fandom, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with that term, it's the fan community around a given TV show or movie, maybe a comics or book series. Um, there are fandoms around bands and things like that. And the people in the community both appreciate what's going on, say, in Doctor Who, and they also might produce their own fan works around that. So that would be things like writing fan fiction, making videos, um, sometimes writing songs. There are bands, uh, wizard rock bands around the Harry Potter fandom where people have fairly professional bands that 
um, write as if they were wizards or muggles or in some way in the Harry Potter world, singing about those sorts of things. Um, one of the areas that we've branched off into a little bit more recently with programs here at LPL is the idea of activism in the community. Our teens are really, really captured right now, um, partly because of schools and I think the idea of preparing for their futures, they're really into the idea of getting volunteer hours and racking up hours and getting involved with as many things as they possibly can, partly to pad resumes and scholarship applications, but also just because they are genuinely interested in giving back or contributing to the community. Oh, screen's going a bit glitchy on my end. That's not good. How are things for everyone else? Very good. Can see everything. Everybody it's else okay? Anymore. I've got giant green glitch patterns going on. No, we're good. We're good? Okay. Just me. Excellent. That's great. Um, activities also it lend themselves really well to doing programs. So running programs around sports, crafts, uh, STEM or STEAM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering. Sometimes there's an A in there for arts and math. So STEM or STEAM. Um, music programs as well are really interesting. The Lethbridge Girls Rock Camp just wrapped last week, and I'm hoping to do something a little more involved with them last year. I've acted in kind of an informal support capacity in terms of book lists and linking their uh, girl campers into various library resources where I can, but to actually make more of a connection with that next summer would be awesome. We also have a really strong connection with our local campus community radio station, CK, uh, CKXU, uh, which runs out of the University of Lethbridge space, but involves a lot of community members in terms of their programming. Learning projects and programs obviously are something that work well for libraries. It's kind of our, I don't know, raison d'etre, I guess, but uh, we've done programs around life skills, um, so adulting type programs, teaching kids how to write resumes, apply for jobs, how to lower their stress levels through yoga or petting kittens or various things like that, how to study for tests and keep on top of their schedules and not get overloaded. Uh, those are all things that we sometimes, I think, as adults assume that they're learning, maybe through school, maybe just on their own, but to give them a chance to come together and really delve into these skills and share their own tips and tricks uh, around these life skills, I think has been really useful. Um, we've had some requests for cultural learning and we occasionally do some things around homework help, though that tends to be very uh, informal here at LPL. What kinds of things have any of you tried for programming at your libraries? What angles have you taken? Um, in Kenmore, we've done a youth writing program, which was okay. really popular. And I just started an anime club. Oh, but nice. We had like one meeting so far. And I'm working on starting an LGBT group in the fall. Excellent. Waiting to see if anybody else is going to pop up. All right. So a lot of this comes down to what can you actually do at your library? And this is going to vary a lot in terms of how big your library is. Lethbridge, we're just inching up on 100,000 people. Um, that's the big thing for us right now. We have two library branches and a bookmobile. We have a fairly extensive staff with lots of interests and lots of knowledge. We have quite large collections and we have fairly decent budgets in terms of being able to set up technology and resources and what we need around programs. Um, what I've found over the years doing teen programs is it comes down a lot of times to what do you already have? What do you have in your bag of tricks? So what do you already know? Um, what are you interested as a staff member in finding more out, uh, finding about, finding out about, there we go. <laughs> so you can share that knowledge with the teenagers. Um, what are the collections that say if you get a grant, what are those collections that you could build specifically for teens and for their interests that would play into services and programs? 
Um, the other big resource that I think we don't necessarily tap into enough is the connections that we make within our communities. So I am working a lot this coming fall with really um, reinforcing our connections with the local Boys and Girls Club. They have a lot of kids. I have a lot of resources. We can put those two things together and really maximize uh, what we both do as organizations serving teens. Um, I also work with the local YWCA, their girl space program. So that's um, both younger teens who are sort of upper elementary all the way up to grade 12 with their older teen group. And we've built a little free library that lives in their space. I keep that stocked with um, both discards from the library's teen collection as well as ARCs, advanced reading copies that I get from the publishers every couple of months. Um, and all of that gets shared through uh, that whole community of girls and then out into the wider community when they go back to school or go into other social situations. Um, the other connections that I have done with the community very much come into that life skills angle. So I've had people from banks and from employment agencies from um, with the kittens that we did come visit uh, purely purely for uh, stress management, not just because they were cute. Uh, those came from the local uh, cat I don't know, charity rehousing kind of group. Um, we've had the Nature Center come and do ecological programs. All those sorts of things where people have knowledge that you don't necessarily have or that you don't have within the library's organizational structure, but you can reach out and really build some partnerships um, in the community and also connect then the teens with those organizations outside the library that they might not even know exist. So with, again, going back to the life skills type stuff, most of the teens wouldn't know that a, an organization like Career Transitions, um, which is a group in Lethbridge, exists in Lethbridge, and that they can go there and say, hey, I need to work on my resume. What can you teach me about that? Can you help me finesse it so I can actually get a job? Can you help me find out where to look for jobs in the city? Um, so connecting them with those organizations through programming that you do at the library is a way to get both benefits to the organization, to the library, and then also to the teenagers that are coming in. Another big point in connecting with teens in the community is the idea of a teen advisory board or a teen advisory group. Uh, how many of you have heard of something like that before? Yeah, the idea has been kicking around for a while. Um, it can be hit or miss, uh, as evidenced by how we've done it in Lethbridge. So we started out with our teen programs, really dedicated teen programming stuff, probably about oh, let's say 10 years ago, just for a nice round number. Uh, we had a really strong teen advisory board at the start of that. We had some very involved kids, um, between five and 10 of them that were really interested in coming up with ideas, prepping for programs, really having a hands-on um, time here at the library. Those kids graduated and with the new group, they were not as dedicated, they were not as useful, <laughs> they were not as interested in being involved. So it's really been a struggle and for the last couple of years, I haven't had an official teen advisory group going at the library. Instead, what I've done is more informal questions and more informal information gathering with the teens that come to programs, with those couple hundred kids that come through the library every day for their lunch hour, for their spares, um, for their unofficial spares when they probably should be in class. Um, all of those kids, I try to make sure that whether they're interested in being part of a formal group or not, they still have a voice in terms of what we're doing at the library. Um, with a formal teen advisory board, usually they meet every month, every two months, whatever's gonna work for you. They give you input in terms of what they would like to see happen at the library, both in terms of collections, programs, anything that uh, they feel is important to them. Um, it's a really great way for keeping your programs and collections up to date in terms of what they're actually interested in. Um, it gives you access to not only what they think, but they can probably give you a good idea of what their peers think at the school, um, within other groups that they're involved with inside the community. It's a really good way to keep that connection over the year with the school and, or with the teens in the library. And it's the idea of having these kids be champions for the library. They're gonna be out there talking to the other kids at their school, talking to the kids hopefully on their soccer teams or dance groups, anything like that. Maybe you know dragging those kids along to the next program and really creating that back and forth between the library kids and the not library kids. 
Um, they're also really good for grassroots marketing. Um, I think marketing to teens is probably the toughest, one of the toughest groups to get a hold of and really connect with. Uh, we do Tumblr and Instagram here at LPL in terms of how we connect with our library teens. I have a couple of teen volunteers who are in charge of updating just kind of general uh, nonsense, I guess, kind of on our Tumblr, and then I post things relevant to the programs. Um, the reasoning behind bringing them in to do those kind of general nonsense and randomosity kind of posts on our Tumblr is it keeps them actually relevant, actually coming from a teen voice, as opposed to me, who is the same age as some of their moms, um, trying to pretend that I know what is cool and what they might be interested in terms of Tumblr memes. Um, so that's, it's kind of a different angle for the marketing than you know traditional uh, social media from the library, but it's a really great way to get the teens involved and get an authentic voice in terms of what you're, what you're promoting to the teens. <clears throat> so when I talked about uh, how I talk to the kids at lunchtime or at spares or things like that in the school or after a program, finding out what they think, um, these are some of the questions that I use. I've pulled them from, which book? I've pulled them from, I can't remember which one. I've pulled them from one of two, these two books, which I will uh, bring up in slides later. Uh, they're both from ALA Publishing and they're really, really solid resources for teen programs. Um, but the idea of asking anytime you're confronted with teens in the library and you can get a conversation going uh, at an actual program, for movies, I'll bring in a stack of movies and say, okay, which one do you want to watch? Or for our anime program when we were running that, I'd just bring up Crunchyroll and be like, all right, go nuts, watch whatever you want, I don't care. Um, for future planning, what do we do next week? What do you want to see next month? What holidays are you excited about and what do you want to celebrate at the library? You know, things like uh, traditional holidays, I guess, but also really random holidays. They like to sometimes celebrate um, characters' birthdays. So like Harry Potter's birthday was July 31st. We didn't do anything this year, but we definitely have done things other summers. In terms of making sure that they feel like they're involved and they're uh, a part of the programs, um, getting them to help with things. Even if you don't need their help, ask them for their help anyhow. Get them to do things. Move tables, move chairs, put up decorations. Um, the teens here really, really like streamers. So we get a lot of streamers decorating for some of our programs. Um, which, you know, easy, cheap, and, you know, makes the space feel a little bit more like theirs when we're using something like this room, which is a big white box of nothingness uh, with a whiteboard and a whole lot of outlets. Um, but it doesn't feel very welcoming, very interesting. Uh, so having them do a little bit of decorating before a program can go a long ways to making it feel more like a teen space. So how do you make sure the library is a welcoming space for teens? There's been a lot of research, a lot of writing around this. Um, there's a whole chapter in this book, Real World Teen Services, about teen library spaces that is just really, really useful. Um, here in Lethbridge, we're doing some major renovations on our downtown, our main branch, and our teen service, or our teen space is moving from the lovely giant windowed, uh, big open south end of the library to a much uh, let's say more condensed space in the North Wing. Uh, so our collections are going to have to shift around a little bit. They're going to have to shrink a little bit and we won't have quite as much lounging space for the teens. That being said, what space we do have then has to be really maximized in terms of how flexible it is, how welcoming it is and what the teens will be able to do in that space. Um, I often think of those teeny tiny little Ikea apartment models that they build in their stores uh, where they have, you know, a family of four living in like 200 square feet or something and you're like, how do they do that? And they do it because they're a little bit crazy. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> but you have to think about your furniture, how flexible it is. You have to think about where you're going to put things, whether it's movable, whether it's fixed, and also how welcoming and teen appropriate a lot of that stuff is. Um, a lot of official library furniture from the vendors is stupid expensive, crazy expensive. If you can get away with going to Ikea or going to other places like that, um, sometimes their stuff is going to be durable enough for what you need it for in the teen space. Uh, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes in terms of chairs and really solid pieces of furniture, you are going to want to go for the higher end markups just because you want it to last. 
Um, with all of that, it's important um, to, again, get your teens input and keep in mind that you don't want the space to feel too childlike in terms of its colors, in terms of its finishes, in terms of the type of furniture you're picking. Um, one of the things that I often look at on Pinterest or online when I'm trying to get ideas for what this space is ultimately going to look like is instead of looking at library spaces or school li public library spaces, school library spaces, classrooms, that sort of thing, the most interesting and I think inspiring things to look at are offices. Um, and not your normal offices, but your things like Google offices or, you know, weird tech startups who have brought in colorful furniture and weird climbing walls and very uh, flexible um, office sort of meeting rooms that are really good for group projects. So the walls will all be glass so that you can write on them or the walls will all be chalkboard finished. So again, you can write on them, you can change them. It's very easy to adapt and use that space in different ways. Um, so this is our current, well, it isn't because things have shifted. This was, up until about a month ago, uh, our team space at the main branch. Um, so we have spinners for the paperbacks. We have movable rolling shelves for some of the smaller collections, like the audiobooks. We have those sweet, sweet chairs that are original to LPL from the 1970s and just have been recovered a couple of times. And I'm really hoping I get to keep those for the new team space um, because they spin. They go around and around and around. Uh, which is delightful. They also have lasted since the 70s and thus are very, very hardy. Um, you can kind of see a little blue bench, or well, a big blue bench in the background. Those have also been really, really popular with our teens. Basically, they're just a big wooden box covered in foam, covered in high durability fabric. Uh, they're good for sitting on. They're good for lounging on. I use them when I'm giving tours to stand on. They're really, uh, because of the fabric we've used, they're really easy to clean, which is important. They get grungy pretty quickly, um, but they work really, really well for a teen space because they are so flexible. This is a shot of our west side branch, the crossings branch. Um, so a lot of our spaces at the crossings branch um, when we opened in 2010 are sponsored. That's why it's the Melkor gaming space. Um, again, we have spinners for the paperbacks, though that has changed. The spinners now have video games and the paperbacks are interfiled with the hardcovers. Um, we have seating for the video games. We have study space. All of it's a little more bright, a little more bold than the rest of the library just to demarcate um, the space. This is our general uh, fireplace reading area in the crossings branch. Um, so this is open to anybody, but it is adjacent to the teen space. The teen space is just to the left of the fireplace. Uh, this is one of the spaces that very much gets taken over by the teens whenever school is in session, and that is totally fine. Um, it's designed as a social space. That's what they're using it for, and that's good with us. Um, the chairs uh, are very nice. This is an older picture. It's a very nice picture because the chairs haven't been quite as beaten up as they are now. Um, they've made it, the chairs have made it very well for seven years in a space attached to two high schools. But they aren't quite, quite as lovely as that anymore. Um, we also have a really big, uh, I don't know, it's not a bulkhead, but the opposite of a bulkhead because it's on the floor, along our south facing windows. And uh, the kids just congregate there like kittens. They love the sunshine. They love the big flat space. They have very much taken over uh, that area, despite the fact that it's next to the adult collections as opposed to the teen collections. Um, they use that as a social space. They use it as a study space. Um, sometimes it's loud. Sometimes it's quiet. It really very much depends on what day it is. So with these spaces, um, I've shown you, I guess, our teen-specific spaces, but I also want you to notice that the teens are in other spaces in the library. They aren't just in the space where um, we've designed the space for them. They're using the other spaces. They're interested in being in other spaces. And that's really important, um, that they feel welcome wherever they go in the library, uh, both by staff and also um, by the public. Uh, we do get a lot of complaints at the Crossings Branch that it's noisy, that there are kids everywhere, and we're like, yes. We're between two high schools. I don't know what else you expect. You know, like what they're allowed in here, you're allowed in here as a grown up. You're going to have to learn how to get along. Um, and so we have people who will not come to the crossings branch during school hours because they find it too chaotic, but 
we're, we're kind of okay with that. You know, if that's the choice that they've personally made, that's fine. Um, I was gonna, my brain just went to ask, how many of you have bathrooms in your library? But I'm hoping you all have bathrooms in your libraries. Um, how many of you have uh, gender divided bathrooms as opposed to single stall bathrooms? Gendered bathrooms? Okay, uh, single, smaller use bathrooms? It's one of the nice things about smaller libraries is often, and smaller buildings just in general, coffee shops and things like that, is often, there's just one bathroom. It's, you know, whoever needs a toilet can go in there. Um, this issue came up uh, partly because we have a queer straight alliance that meets uh, for youth that meets at the library. And also just because we're moving forward as an organization and this is something uh, that's important. Um, so our new, uh, our single stall bathrooms, so the ones um, that are just one large space, uh, formerly we considered them kind of the wheelchair, I mean all of our bathrooms are wheelchair accessible, but wheelchair sort of specific or family bathrooms. Um, we've changed all of our signage recently to, it's not exactly this, but it's very similar to this, um, so that anybody can go in there, we want them to know that they can go in there, and we want everybody else to know that it's okay for anyone to use those bathrooms. Um, and maybe just, you know, get people thinking about the issue a little bit more. Uh, my Queer Straight Alliance, the, the QSA program, um, the youth in that actually wrote a very nice letter and prepared some examples of signage that they would like to see on the bathroom doors and uh, sent it into the board who then made the approval for us to change our signs. So that was a, a nice moment, I think, for the QSA youth to see, uh, to propose a change and then see that change actually become active. Um, my preference for signs was actually just to put this on the bathroom doors, but we figured that would be complicated with copyright and people would still get cranky. I like it, I don't know. I, I think having a giant horse's butt on a bathroom would be great. Um, another important element I think in making um, spaces welcoming is not so much just the physical space, but the staff training and the staff comfort in dealing with teens. So I'm the teen brarian, but I'm, I'm one person. I am very, very far from being the only person that teens ever talk to. Um, mostly, I'm the person doing programs, uh, but everybody who works on our customer service desks is going to come in contact with teenagers. People who work at our reference desks are gonna come in contact with teenagers. People who are just in the building working are going to come in contact with teenagers and need to feel comfortable with them and be able to interact with them. Um, we've done a bit of training, um, especially at the Crossings Branch because of that high school situation. Uh, and I really think it's important for all library staff to have this basic knowledge of, you know, the, the life and times of teenagers and kind of what's going on. Um, I really find it fascinating in terms of what's going on in their brains. I know, I think we hear a lot about um, the body changes that are going on with teenagers, obviously, but their brains are going through massive, massive changes. Basically, they really are overgrown toddlers. Um, so when you're a toddler, you have all of these new connections being built up in your brain, and then when you're a teenager, your brain goes, okay, time to get rid of the ones that we don't need anymore. So the level of activity in terms of how your brain is changing is equal when you're a teenager to when you're, you know, two, three, four-year-old. Um, but we don't give teens the same break that we give, say, a two and a half year old who's having a meltdown. Um, partly because they're larger and louder. Well, not necessarily louder. Partly because they're larger. Um, and also, we do expect more from them. Uh, though there are days when they are just, they do not have the capacity to function at that level. Um, it's also important to kind of have an idea of what's going on maybe in the school and the community at large that's going to impact teens. Uh, so we've seen a lot of numbers coming out since November in the States uh, in terms of how teenagers are um, feeling the impacts of the federal election in the States and the new president and how they feel about that and how a lot of them really are not comfortable with what has happened there and the stress levels that are skyrocketing. Uh, in terms of their reactions to that whole political situation. Um, on a smaller scale, you might see that in your own community. If there's something really big happening in the city, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it might be a festival is coming to town and everybody is completely pumped about that. Um, or it might be some big social issue, or it might be a car crash. 
Um, I remember when I was in high school, there was a huge crash outside of the city that uh, killed a couple of the kids that I went to school with. And that had a huge impact, of course, on all of the teenagers in the city because they knew these kids. So being aware and having your staff be aware of those types of things is really going to make a difference uh, in terms of what they have in the backs of their heads when they're talking to teens and maybe, you know, getting some weird reactions from the teens, being able to process that in terms of, okay, well, this is happening in their lives right now. This is happening in their brains right now. That might be why they're having this reaction. Other days, you know, they have days. That are, you know, my dad taught uh, junior high and high school for 30 years, and his saying was always, you know, there's crazy in the water today. And it's, yeah, that happens. All right, so how do you make sure that your library is reflecting your teen's needs? Um, it's important to have an idea of what the teen's needs are. Um, there's a group in the States called the Search Institute who have done masses and masses of research into development and um, the sort of strengths and assets that teens need to make it through teenagehood into adulthood uh, in the best possible way. Um, so they've developed kind of uh, from this research uh, a guiding document called the 40 Developmental Assets for Adolescents or for Teens. Um, and that are further broken down into four, uh, two main areas, which are subdivided into four sub areas, I guess. So they talk about external assets and internal assets. Has anybody uh, read about this or heard about this before? Has this come up in any community groups that you've been in touch with? Okay, so new things. Um, it is, it's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a for-profit thing. Um, you can get most of this stuff online if you want printed copies or if you want workshops or anything. Of course, there is a cost. Um, but even just this uh, sort of list of developmental assets is really, really useful, I find, when I'm thinking about my programs and trying to decide um, sort of what angle to take on them. So for inter external assets uh, that are going to make for a stronger teen, um, if they have support, from multiple sources. So these are things that are acting on the teen um, from external sources. So support from multiple people in their lives, uh, whether it's parents, other family, school people, uh, community groups. Um, the more non-family adults a teen has in their life that are supportive, um, that are caring, uh, the stronger that teen is gonna be. And the more, you know, they have more support, they have more places to turn, if they need to. Um, they're empowered, so again, with the support, they are given chances to um, kind of act out in good ways. Um, they also have boundaries and expectations, so people are setting rules for them and expecting them to follow those rules rather than giving them complete freedom. Um, they're expected to have a constructive use of time, so they may have uh, things scheduled, you know, like every Tuesday they have soccer, and every second Friday, they have a youth group, um, all of these sorts of things. Uh, they are expected to have their homework done before they can go you know, out and uh, skateboard with their friends, things like that. Um, so all of these different uh, external assets are kind of out there acting upon the teen in a positive way. Um, in terms of internal assets, they're things that the teen, qualities the teen has sort of built up within themselves. Um, so commitment to learning. Um, they can be influenced by others to be interested and committed to school and lifelong learning and exploring the world around them. Um, but it's really an internal choice that they've made to be committed and interested in learning things. Um, they have a sense of positive values, um, whether those are coming, again, from... We, with younger kids, we see it coming from external sources, so, again, family, um, religion, uh, community. As they get older, obviously, their peers are going to have more of an influence on that, but also their own discoveries of the world are very much going to influence what they value and what's important to them. Uh, for social competencies, um, that's things like being involved in the community, um, whether they have different groups that they work with, whether they volunteer, um, whether they take an interest in their neighborhood and keeping it tidy and keeping it um, pleasant to walk around. Uh, they also have a positive sense of self 
Um, so they have a good sense of who they are, what their identity is, you know, what their interests are. Um, and that becomes, um, it's developed enough that it's hard to shake. Uh, they have a real sense of who they are and their own place in the world. Um, so again, out of the 40 things that are broken down under these eight different sort of asset categories, the more of these that a teen has going on in their life, uh, the stronger they will be, the, le the more resistance they're going to be, resistant they will be to um, drugs, alcohol, negative situations, uh, basically of any kind, because they have all this, uh, all these good assets kind of backing them up and holding them up in the world. Um, a lot of these can be angled into teen programs and just into our daily uh, interactions with teenagers. Um, so that idea of having positive adult influences in their lives, the library staff can be that positive influence. You know, you can be happy to see the teen. You can ask them how their soccer game went, how that swim meet went, you know, how band practice and the big concert went. If, you know, you know what's going on with the teen. Um, they're wearing headphones, you say, so what kind of music are you interested in? Maybe get into some sort of conversation like that. It just gives them that feeling that there's another person out there who's interested in them and who cares. Um, from that, again, with your teen advisory board um, or whoever's helping you in terms of the youth with the programs, it's really important to evaluate the programs and services that you're running for your teens. So uh, I tend to do... Depending on the program, I will do either paper or online surveys. Sometimes I do both, but it's usually one or the other. Uh, with things like our fan clubs, I'm just going to do a quick little paper survey, about four questions at the last couple of sessions that we're doing, just to get a feel for what worked, what didn't, um, what uh, they actually got out of the program, as opposed to what I think they might have gotten out of the program. Um, for longer programs or... Uh, things like our volunteer programs where I don't get a lot of actual face time with the teens. Uh, I do do um, online surveys, uh, us usually using SurveyMonkey or something like that to get their feedback. Um, as with anything like that, the rate of response is pretty low, but at least it's something. Uh, I also find it really useful to just have conversations ongoing with the teenagers. Um, so informally at programs or when I'm just wandering through the library and I see a teen that I recognize, I'll ask them for uh, some feedback, for some help, for some evaluation on something that they've been at. What did they think? What, did, what should I do differently? What do they want to see in the future? Um, with the teen advisory group, it can be more formalized in terms of conversation at one of the meetings. Um, and it's also really important to have conversations with your stakeholders, with other uh, organizations in the city that you're working with, even ones that you're not working with, but that also serve the, serve the same target audience. So anybody who's working with teenagers, you want to kind of have a good, good enough rapport with them um, that you can kind of share with them successes and failures and get ideas for maybe something they can't do for their teens, but their teens are looking for the library has the capacity to step in and offer that support, that kind of programming. So successes and then later failures <laughs> from Lethbridge Public Library. So I, I wanted to make sure I give you some examples of the things that we do here. Uh, one of the ones I'm right in the middle, well, I'm three quarters of the way through it. Uh, this is one of our summer programs this year called Broadcast Boot Camp. It's in partnership with CKXU, the radio station at the university, and it was four afternoons this summer. We got these kids together. Um, when I asked them why they came, they kind of didn't say anything, so I asked if their moms made them come, and they said yes. So <laughs> they all kind of got dumped at the library to do a program with the radio station uh, where we talked about what is community radio, what is campus radio, what do you need to do to do an interview? What do you need to know? Um, this shot is from Wednesday when we actually went to the station. We did some recording. We did some exploring in the music library. Uh, generally just had a great time. Um, and then on Friday, the radio station is bringing their live on location resources to the library. And we're going to do some um, station calls, we're going to do some ad recording for local businesses. Um, if they want, they can write their own ads. Um, ads on community radio are a lot goofier, a lot more ridiculous than what you hear on uh, commercial radio. So I'm pretty sure anything the teens come up with will be uh, right on board with what CKXU usually plays. 
Uh, we also have a summer program where I have a chance for the teens to come in and do book bundles. So uh, after a short training session, um, they uh, are equipped to come in, grab the book bundle bucket, they grab a couple of picture books, occasionally some kids nonfiction, along a certain theme, tie a big bow around it, slap a label with the theme on it, and then put it on display. The really nice thing about this is they can do it whenever they want. So whenever the library is open, they can come in. Um, it's not dependent on the library's schedule. It's only uh, available to them whenever they need it to be. Um, for that, at the end of the summer, I'll be writing reference letters saying, you know, to whom it may concern. Bob volunteered for 16 hours of the library over the summer, creating book bundles for the children's department, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they're getting, they're getting that out of it. We're getting some really, really lovely displays. Um, this is just an example of some of the things that they've come up with. So three books about summer, or three books about uh, Ladybug Girl, which is a series. That one's kind of easy. I'm not quite sure where they went with that. Um, the other program that is probably one of our longest running ones uh, is our Doctor Who fan club, Bow Ties Are Cool. Uh, so we meet once a month, and it's all nerdy little Doctor Who people, and me and my Doctor Who t-shirts and whatnot. Um, and we talk about the classics and we talk about the current season and we build paper tardises and we eat fish fingers and custard and various things like that. We watch YouTube videos, all of that kind of stuff and it gives them a chance to really um, engage with the fandom and connect with each other. Most of these kids do not go to the same schools uh, so it lets them find other people in the city that they wouldn't necessarily meet in their day-to-day -day lives um, and connect over something that they have in common. Uh, we have done an anime fan club, uh, but the numbers dwindled to basically nothing, uh, so that one doesn't happen anymore for us. Um, the other big one uh, that's been going for two, maybe three years now, is our Queer Straight Alliance. Um, it started out as Gay Straight Alliance, uh, but they wanted to change it because uh, for most younger people, uh, queer is a larger uh, umbrella term. Um, it, it, incorporates uh, more identities um, and more orientations um, than just a gay straight alliance. Uh, we worked on various things, uh, various activities in terms of thinking, what do we want the group to be? Where do we want to go with it? Um, this is one of the sort of neatened up graphics that I threw together. Um, it started on a whiteboard and was completely illegible until I kind of threw it together in actual uh, graphics. Um, but we play board games, we watch movies, we talk about current events, we do education. Um, as uh, the library staff member who runs the QSA in BC and Prince George said, basically anything can be a QSA program, just add rainbows and glitter. Um, and it, it kind of is that way. There, it's really not that much different uh, from the sort of programs that I regularly do with the teens. It's just that this one is marketed at that specific audience and they know that they're gonna see people um, at these meetings that are supportive of who they are and who they want to be. Um, it's in partnership with Outreach Southern Alberta and the Boys and Girls Club here in Lethbridge. The Boys and Girls Club runs a QSA that is ages 14 to 18 because that works uh, for what their sort of catchment and what their rules are at the Boys and Girls Club. Ours is ages 16 to 21. So it's kind of a teen program, kind of a, I don't know, new adult program. Um, mostly because the teens that started at the Boys and Girls Club, QSA, needed somewhere to go once they got too old to go to that. So we uh, changed the ages of the one at the library and it's been going really well ever since. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we get a little bit more involvement from both our college and university uh, pride groups in the coming year. I'm gonna be poking them to do more with us. All right, uh, failures, so programs that didn't work. Um, I mentioned the uh, anime club, um, the anime manga club. That one worked really well for a few years. Uh, and then we got to the point where it was, you know, the same two kids and that was it. Uh, at which point I said, you guys can just be friends and watch this at home. Um, because the availability of um, the screening and the streaming and stuff like that is much higher than it used to be. When we started our anime club, 
there was very little in terms of legal streaming uh, available online. And the library was very much one of the only places that you could watch some of these uh, shows. So um, that, I mean, it was really, it was fun. It was successful. We did crafts. We ate weird food. Um, we had a bit of a sponsorship from one of the uh, import food stores here in town. And then it just fizzled. So at that point, it's run its course. And we might have one again if there's interest. But for now, there isn't. So it's gone. Um, I've also had various book clubs that have started out really strong and then fizzled over the years. Um, the thing with teen programs is they often do come with a finite time stream attached to them. Um, once you know the, the cohort that was interested in something has graduated or moved on to other things, the program tends to die. You don't necessarily have, you know, the first wave of kids coming in that are really, really interested in having a monthly book club. And then, you know, a similar group is not going to come along and be exactly the same. You might get a slightly similar group that's really interested in having a comic book club or um, a poetry club or something that's similar but not exactly the same. So it's important to be um, adaptable and not really see things as failures, but just things that have, yeah, run their course, moved on, and need a bit of a change to keep going. Any comments on programs? Stories that you want to share about your own? Canmore, I think? Yeah, we had good luck with um, cosplay. Mm -hmm. Lots of fun craft pro possibilities, parties, parades, and then, you know, kids can go into Calgary and go to the uh, Comic-Con if they are so Excellent. We just had uh, here at the Crossings Branch, we had our very first library Comic-Con. Because um, for us, we're two hours away from, well, depending on where you're going in Calgary, two to two and a half hours away from Calgary. Uh, and a lot of kids can't make it, either because of schedule or because of money. Um, we used to have two uh, Entertainment Expo, Comic-Con, Fan Expo type things happening in Lethbridge. They both fizzled in the same year. They both quit doing that. So while we do have an anime and manga festival that happens yearly at the university, which is amazing, there wasn't really anything else like that in the library uh, or in the city. So we stepped up as a library and had a whole uh, Saturday where it was Comic-Con at the library. So we had a superhero story time. And then later I kind of convinced all of my teen fan clubs to each run a session. So they ran panels. We had a screening of the Avengers, um, and then we had a cosplay contest later in the day, judged by the cosplay club from one of the high schools. Um, so it was an all-ages program, but it was very much dependent on teen involvement and teen volunteers um, and skewed towards the teen interest. Um, so that was really, really fun. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Any spectacular failures? I think it was the CEO of Calgary at one point who said that it's better to have spectacular failures than mediocre success. And I think that's an interesting way to think, especially teen programs or kids programs. Um, so some of the resources that I really, really like and that I've really come to, uh, well, yeah, sure, come to depend on. Let's say that. Uh, so this was one of the books that I mentioned earlier, Real World Teen Services. Um, this is out from ALA Editions, so the um, American Library Association, uh, and it is a 20, 2015. Um, it's a tiny book. It's not very, it's maybe like, maybe a centimeter wide. It's not very big, uh, but it is probably the best little book um, that I would recommend in terms of somebody new to teen services, in terms of somebody really looking to um, expand or reinvent their teen services. Uh, it's very straightforward. It gives lots of good examples of programs and ways to get started and reasoning and arguments so that, you know, you say, well, we, we need somebody to do these types of programs and you know, the powers that be say, why do we need teenagers in the library? And you say, well, because of this. This is why we need teenagers in the library. If we lose them as teenagers, they will not come back. That's it. We might get them back when they have kids of their own, but we've lost them for the 20 years in between. 
Um, and that, that's a big impact on libraries. If, if we lose um, these younger, um, oops, if we use, lose the younger people, then we'll lose them as, as older people. Um, this one just came out this uh, year, actually this summer, I think, uh, Putting Teens First in Library Services. It's another um, ALA publication. This one is from the Young Adult Library Services Association, or YALSA. Um, it's a lot more into the theory and the research, uh, so a lot more numbers, but there also are, I'll just find one now, uh, da, 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 these case studies. Um, so this one, for example, is a case study from Johnson County Library, wherever that might be, about a digital storytelling program. So they give you an outline of the program, they say what worked, what didn't, and how you might adapt that for your own library. Um, the Teen Services Underground is a great little website. Uh, it's been going for a while uh, and has great resources in terms of program ideas, uh, book talks, uh, Q and A's. You can also send in questions if you say, I don't know what to do with this situation. Send in a, a question about it and you'll get answers back from librarians all across North America. Teen Librarian Toolbox is also a really useful site. Um, it's been adopted by school library journal, but it began as an independent blog. Um, again, it's a lot of program ideas um, as well as uh, book reviews and thoughts about teens and libraries in general. Um, those are kind of the two, the two big online resources, I would say. Questions, comments, ideas? Canmore. I have a question. Um, mm. how, how do you deal with or avoid teens developing kind of inappropriate ideas about their relationships with you like more like you don't want, <laughs> you well not I'm not talking about necessarily romantic or anything but it, no but you line, become their best friend exactly the line between being Possibly their librarian friend. and being their friend yes yeah. <laughs> yes um sometimes I give undirected mini lectures at the start of programs about personal space <laughs> or you know like not touching other people if they don't want to be touched, both, you know, because they stand too close to me or because, you know, they're creeping out the other kids. Um, that definitely happens. Uh, you know, I think it's important not to, you know, within the group setting, at least not to focus on, you know, the one teen who's annoying. Um, and maybe try to, you know, redirect them into another group so that they maybe do have other friends to hang out with or, um, if you know of good, depending on what they're interested in, um, say you have a teen that's really into writing or something like that, but you're the only one that they know of that's into books and writing and stories and things like that, you might be able to redirect them into an online community as long as it's one, you know, that's, that's safe and stuff like that, but say the NaNoWriMo um, National Novel Writing Month community or something like that. Find, if hopefully you can find something to kind of distract them with. Um, I do tend, because I am the same age as most of my teenagers, well, not most, but a lot of my teenagers' moms, which is terrifying. Um, I used to kind of like sit when we were watching movies or something like that. I would sit with them in the group and stuff like that. I don't do that as much anymore. I tend to sit at the back of the room kind of off by myself, um, partly because I don't always want to hang out right next to them. Um, they are... They can be fragrant, let's just say, <laughs> and I sometimes need my own space. Um, and also, yeah, I want them to bond with each other and create those connections as opposed to, yeah, bonding with me because I don't, I don't need that level of friendship in my life. Does that help a little? Oh, yeah. 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 That would, that's one of those questions that would be an awesome question for a Teen Services Underground for their ask an, ask an agent sort of thing. Others? Do you have any, um, it's, it's a big topic, but do you have any like short advice about bullying in a group if you've got yeah. someone someone else? Um, I think ground rules are important. Um, that was one of the things with the last uh, teen advisory group that we came up with, is we came up with ground rules for our meetings. And we started out with a really, really big list and it came down to four and I'm going to have to see if I can remember them off the top of my head. The first rule is no smiting, uh, mm -hmm. which 
gives me a chance to explain what smiting is and basically just says, let me say, don't touch anybody if they don't want to be touched. Um, what's our second one? Uh, I think our second one is accept everyone. Um, they went with very broad concepts for their rules. Uh, what's the third one? The third one is around um, like language, but more, yeah, in terms of name calling and stuff like that. I just can't remember what we shrank it down to. Uh, and then the third, the fourth one is share the snacks because we have people who <laughs> hoard the chips. <laughs> they take the chip bowl and they run. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of those rules I think get into the, the bullying problems that can arise. Um, and I think, again, like sort of the mini lectures or the, the information given at the very start of each program, it can feel really boring and they're gonna, you know, lounge about and roll their eyes and be annoyed about it. Um, but if, you know, it's important to kind of, I think, lay those ground rules and get everybody on the same page. Say, these are the expectations and also these are the consequences. So if you can't handle this, you don't have to be here. You can go. Um, and sometimes, I mean, with the board games especially, we have had kids, I've had kids come up to me and say, they're picking on me and they keep killing my character. And I have to say, you're playing a Dungeons and Dragons board game that's kind of par for the course. You know, like, you're going to die. That's the game. Um, and, you know, like, sometimes it will with that kind of stuff. You know, you are going to get the kid who gets killed more than others and they're going to feel picked on. Um, I, with that, I'm going to redirect and say, okay, well, come play this game with, you know, these other kids. Or have you tried this solo game? Maybe that's a better fit for you. Um, we've done some actual, uh, have we? I think we have done, I think one of the life skills one was kind of more of a bullying thing. Um, we've screened documentaries and done community chats and things like that around those issues, um, more in a larger form than, than teens specifically. Um, but I think that kind of gets them thinking about it maybe in a different way than they get from the schools. Um, I'm just trying to think of techniques during actual programs and things. Um, redirecting the entire group into a different activity, making them split up, um, you know, and, and making them take a break if, if we have to stop a movie because it's you know, a horrible experience for something and they have to talk about it, I'll, I'll make them talk about it. Again, they kind of hate me for that day, but it'll, it'll happen. Does that help? <laughs> um, I find uh, classroom management, so teaching uh, techniques and stuff like that, if you can find some good guides on that, that can be really useful, depending on your group. It, um, sometimes it's crowd management um, techniques that are gonna you know, solve some of those prob problems for you. Anybody else? All right, we might be good. If you think of anything, um, like I said, you can always you can always email me. You can always uh, throw things at me on Twitter. That's where I am. Probably too much. Probably there too much. Not as much as I used to be because, again, the American election happened and everybody's always talking about that and I can only handle so much. Um, all of the programs and things uh, that we do at LPL are at lethlib.ca. Um, our Instagram is LPL Teen Zone um, if you want to see pictures and things like that from our programs. And our Tumblr is LPL Teen Zone as well. I should have put that on a slide. Um, actually, I can just do Come on, Internet. There we go. So this is our Tumblr. So like I said, there's a lot of nonsense that's posted on here, but there's also it's uh, the Wi-Fi in this room is really slow. So apologies while the images load. Um, there's a lot of nonsense get, that gets posted to here by my teen volunteers. And there's also stuff about our program. So this is another shot uh, from Broadcast Boot Camp when we were over at the radio station, checking things out and talking to the music director. Um, you know, lib library memes, all that important stuff. 
Um, yeah, so again, it's a, it's a weird little way for them to have a bit of a voice, a bit of an impact, um, and, you know, some commentary in a sharky sort of way. These are our TARDIS doors. The high school made us a mural on oh. a bunch of our, well, they made us a bunch of murals on our walls at the Crossings Branch, and one of them is a TARDIS, which I'm stoked about. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you for um, attending this session, and I hope it was useful. If you have any questions, do please get in touch, and I will do my best to answer them. If you have uh, questions about the resources, I believe the slides will be up somewhere to look back on, and hopefully you can move ahead with teen services and being awesome, because that's what we do. We're awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>